Coming up on Theatre Talk. It's an incredibly precious uh, event, Harry Potter. And if we've got it wrong, you can't, you can't, you know, put lights around it and then hopefully push it up. It w mm -hmm. would have been in real, I mean, it would have just died. You could it spoil been, it easy. Yeah. It would have been forgotten rinsed. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'd have yeah. been rinsed. It would have been yeah. put quietly to where nobody remembered it. From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and with me this week is my guest co-host, Gordon Cox, theater editor of Variety. Welcome, Gordon. And this week, our focus is Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, the most anticipated play of the season. It was a smash hit in London where it won nine Olivier Awards, and it has just opened on Broadway with the London production intact. Our guests are the show's co-creator and director, John Tiffany, and the movement director, Stephen Hoggett. Both John and Stephen are old hands at creating theater on Broadway, and they first made their mark here on Broadway with their 2011 Tony-winning show, Once, and have gone on to do so many things. So we are taping this while this show is in rehearsals and previews, and I haven't seen it, but I invited Gordon here, who went all the way to London Sun last London. year, yeah. and knows the score. So, Gordon? So, John Stephen, as I understand it, this project came about when the producers, Sonia Friedman and Colin Callender, approached J.K. Rowling, um, who'd been sort of besieged with offers to create yeah. the next chapter of Harry Potter, whatever that is, um, convinced her to do it, and then then you were brought on board on the project, then I know that you were there sort of at the top of their wish list for people they wanted to work well, that's with. that's what they tell me. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, well, actually, the, uh, Joe had been approached about adapting. Um, this is Joe Rowling. Uh, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, Joe. <laughs> yeah, she's Joe. Okay, Rowling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she, she'd been approached about adapting the books um, uh, as musicals, and she just said no to all of them, or as stadium shows, or as you know, kind of theme park events, and she, she said no to everything. And then Sonia and Colin had approached her and met with her in Edinburgh, and they'd kind of got her into a conversation about Harry as, a, as an adult, and uh, you know, how, how you deal with the fact that for 11 years, you didn't know, you know that anyone loved you, and that you were an orphan, and you, know, you had a horrible, horrible life, and how that kind of affects you when you become an adult. Um, and at that point, they brought me on, and I think they, originally they, they were in, uh, imagining something a bit smaller than we've currently got now with the whole so, actors yeah. and yeah. two parts and um, a purpose-built theatre. But um, I started to talk about uh, how we might move the story on. And, Jack, and the writer? Jack Thorne. Jack Thorne, yeah. He, yeah, Jack and Stephen came on um, board immediately and, and uh, we started to talk about actually starting from where the last book ends, which is a chapter called 19 Years Later, the epilogue where Harry is, uh, Harry and Ginny are at uh, Hog uh, the Hogwarts Express, about to send their middle child, Albus Severus Potter, to Hogwarts for the first time. So, so we thought that we would uh, start there and then move on. So when did you start in on, on these meetings between Jack and John and Joe? Um, I, I first, well, I, I was actually here in New York when John rang me. I was working on Rocky at the time. Yes. I was in tech and it was dark and I was cold, it was freezing and I was a bit glum and John said, I've been asked to work on Harry Potter. What do you think about it? I said the word yes before the sentence ended. <laughs> and then I realized that John was like, okay, let's, and he put the phone down. And I suddenly was like, ooh, what have I just, what have I just thrown him at? So I, I remember watching, doing a very quick watch of the films again. And, um, and then actually it was, it was a, I remember about f six months later towards the end of the year and you'd already started to talk to Jack about some of the things in the plot. And then we had a workshop, the that was 2013, so it wasn't until 2014 that we got some workshop time. Yeah. And there's some space to start making material. Were you fans before this? How, how well did you know the books and or movies? I thought I was a fan until the fans turned up. <laughs> yeah. Because the fans are, are yeah. devotional and I, I, I do not count myself as being uh, as, as knowledgeable as any of those. I think you had to be of a particular age, didn't you? If you were 11 when that first book came out and 
you know, which 11 year old doesn't think that they're leading the wrong life and they not, don't want a, a letter to come from an owl to tell them they really should be <laughs> your parents going to, you know, yeah. Scotland to train to be a wizard or a witch, you know. Um, but we were a little bit, just a little bit older, a couple of years. Yeah, just one, <laughs> just one or two. When the first book came out. But I'd actually met Joe when my first ever job was in Edinburgh at the Traverse Theatre, uh, which is a new writing theatre there. And I was an assistant director and uh, the Traverse was one of the first places in Edinburgh to sell cappuccinos. And so it had a brilliant cafe, and I was in there quite a lot meeting actors and writers. And I kept seeing this woman with a pram sat writing. And we got to no, saying hello no, to each other. No, I don't other. believe Hon honestly, that. Is that true? Totally <laughs> true. We got to saying hello to each other. Um, and now and again, she would sit with a cappuccino for like three hours uh, writing, as it turned out, Harry Potter and the uh, Philosopher's Sorcerer's Stone here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I realised about 18 months later when the first book came out that it had been Nick J.K. Rowling. Well, when you met her, did she tell you what she was doing? No. 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 I, I, she, she, now and again, she would say, do you mind if I, I was like, no, no. I thought, uh, yeah, I, I was worried that she was writing a play, a terrible play that she would try and make us put on. <laughs> did she strike you in those conversations as, as this extraordinary mind or are you were just taken by I mean surprise? it was just a, a literally a greeting yes, and, and you know and I would just say you're absolutely fine right. you know you stay there as long as you want and she she wrote uh, she wrote the that first book in three cafes in rotation so Harry Potter wouldn't have happened without you is what you like to say yeah. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but no, I, think she, I, I think she'd have written it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when we met again in 2014, and uh, she, she recognised me, obviously I knew who she was, but she went, oh, we've met before, haven't we? And, and, and I, I, I kind of recapped the story, and, and uh, she was like, oh, okay. So that was a lovely way in. In the description of uh, your working t together on with Jack Thorne and, and, and J.K. Rowling on this story, you say, well, we just let our imaginations run wild. We just did let it go wherever it went. Yeah. Then you came, were there places in the script where you went, how are we going to realize that? Or were, were you just good with everything? No, there were most of it Every was page. how, most of it was how are we going to do that? <laughs> most of it was, I think. But in some ways, I think certainly the way that Jack has a, a confidence certainly in John's vision of things and the way that I might implement, uh, uh, you know, performers. Um, I mean, John, you you were very kind of just said, Jack, just write, just you know, go for go for anything. And as a you know, as a trio, when they came back with that first, actually, was it was it the first twenty pages that came yeah. first? Yeah, the yeah, first yeah. twenty pages came came across, and. Uh, just from the get-go, it was you just knew it would it would be incredibly challenging, but I would I had never seen something like that on stage before. But did you feel like I can do it? No, <laughs> For abject fear first of all. Really? Yeah. I, I think so, but but also I think because because I think because the theatricality of it was so difficult. I will say that it saved us from ever really worrying about whether we were dealing with Harry Potter. It, it, it was so, that fear was so large and prominent as theatre makers. Yeah. Now, that I, I genuinely think that we forgot that we, it was Harry Potter that was this massive film, filmic event and this huge literary uh, kind of uh, canon. You slightly, it slightly got put on the back burner because we, just had, we had too, too many things to worry about on, the, on our page. Well, of, what was of, your biggest worry? That it wouldn't be magical, wouldn't, yeah. and that we'd have to resort to, to something other than theatre. And we, we said from the get-go that the reason why we decided a yes on this is because we had a, 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 a version or a vision in our heads where theatre did it best, and that's something that's that's hard to, to make people believe that that's a true comment or statement. So what and would theatre do best? Oh, the, the light, yeah. <laughs> well, now I, are there projections? Uh, video, no, 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 ah. no not, not us, no, not, not, not that you would know. So there's no kind of big CGI attempts or anything. No. It's all very lo-fi. It's, it's theatre. It's pretty. But now you, you have people flying. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe. All right. <laughs> you see, I can't give away spoilers because <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know them. But now, what did you find particularly magical? No spoilers, please. You know, actually, what I found magical. First of all, there's one really cool effect that I'll tell you about after this that uh, was my favorite thing and you proceeded to do it over and over and it made me happy every time. Um, but what I actually found most magical was the, because you concentrated on making it so theatrical, I felt like there were moments, my favorite moment is this entirely wordless, I don't even know how it's notated in the script, a uh, sequence that you guys call the staircase ballet that is a really beautiful piece of theatrical storytelling. It is, and it could only exist in theater. It cannot, and there is no other medium in which that story could be told in that exact way. Um, and it feels, 
it's really struck me as the kind of show, the kind of moment where at least one kid in that audience is going to sit up and go, wait a minute, theater can do this, and yeah. maybe want to see some more. Yeah, I mean, the it kind of comes out of uh, me and Stephen and Jack working together, and Christine Jones, the designer, mm -hmm. on Let the Right One In as well. We, right. we you know, we we we've known each other. There's another long. unlikely uh, story to adapt into theater. That's yeah. about vampires, Absolutely. child vampires. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> one child vampire. Um, and there was a sequence in that where basically it's the falling in love sequence where Oscar, uh, the bullied boy, and Eli, the the, the vampire. And um, it's where they, they just run around the stage between silver birch trees, uh, uh, kind of swapping and, 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 and grabbing off each other foam bananas, don't they? Mm. Uh, and, ja and Jack, it's Jack's favorite moment in, in the whole show. And, and so when it came to this particular sequence where things are, you know, the, the relationship is in a dark uh, place for Albus and Scorpius, who are the, two, the next generation two main characters, we thought that we'd give that a go. I mean, it it's also kind of taps into the fact that, you know, how, how do you put Hogwarts on stage? And, uh, you know, because it's, it is a magical place, as Stephen said, but we could smell something, couldn't we, about mm. suitcases, cloaks and, and staircases. staircases yeah. That we just thought was very, very, very theatrical. So The visual vocabulary is very special. Sparse, we should say. Right? Yeah. Or, I mean, tell the crew that. Yeah, well, exactly. It's actually quite a lot, but, there's, like the budget, but it's kept right? to yeah, a very yeah. uh, minimal kind of uh, palette, yeah. I guess. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Because, I mean, you know, theatre is all about suggestion and imagination and all those things. So I knew that, you know, that Stephen would have great fun with, you know, creating Hogwarts out of staircases that would be manipulated by actors. Yeah. And you did, didn't you? But that, but that scene in particular, it, it was a scripted scene to start with. Yeah. And, and with lines. Yeah, yeah. Okay. both the boys were speaking during it. And I think it is that thing where if, you know, you're working with a writer and, you know, with John as the director and the three, of, you know, and with Christine and we just sit there and we watch it. And Jack was the person who took away a few lines after a few runs of it. And then he took away a few more. And then John and I just waited then. He was running it a few more times. And it is that beautiful thing where he just said, look, just get rid of all the lines. <laughs> and it's, and it's, not like, it's not like I thought that would happen or, or John put it in place so that that would be the event in the end. It's just... The lines might have stayed, but they, they weren't necessary. And Jack, as a writer, is not is not going to let a line stand in the way of, of storytelling. Well, that's that's very not generous. an oxymoron. Well, yeah, and yeah. he's he's but also he gave us those lines with which John and I then start to build a, a sequence on stage. That's that's a visual physical sequence. So you it, you, you can talk about it until the cows come home, but ultimately it's like a, it's like a cyclical event. Yeah. That just in the end, there's a version that sits in front of an audience. Um, going back to your producers, uh, uh, Sonia Friedman and Colin Callender, who initiated this project. Did they put any restrictions on you? Did they say, now we really need this or we don't need that? Or did J.K. Rowling? Or, yeah, well, she, but she was there in the, in yes. the room when yeah. they were. Um, no, they'd, all they did was liberate us, all of them. I mean, Joe, Joe and Jack and I, we spent probably about a year developing the story. But alongside that, we were doing kind of development workshops, weren't we, for, mm. for you know, how we would develop the language, for how we would, you know, with suitcases and cloaks and staircases, etc for how we might start to put the, the, the Harry Potter verse on stage. Um, and, and, and it was actually Colin and Sonia who, when Jack and I uh, and Joe, we had the idea for how part one ends, which is quite a cliffhanger, but obviously I won't tell you. Um, when we had that idea and we realized we weren't going to be able to get to that point within an hour and a quarter or something. Uh, I remember being in a, in a, in a cafe in London and, and Sonia and Colin said, which is kind of amazing for producers, knowing that, that you know that they would have to deal with this. Went, why don't you do it in two parts? Oh, um, which is a nightmare for mm. them. But we just went, yeah. <laughs> it's a nightmare for them in terms of booking and just, all these. Things. It's just an audience; and they're not used, to, you know, booking the booking yeah. I mean, system. You get more money, but an audience. Well, yeah, yes. Well, you know, you can only do eight shows a week yeah. still. Yeah, well, so oh, you very, do, you know, very four, true, yeah. four of each part. So, I mean, ultimately, but but you also have the headache of you know do, what can can people buy tickets for individual yes. parts? Yes. Can you know our audience is going to you know devote from two o'clock till ten thirty? Are they going to be happy to devote that time to a piece of theatre when they're used to two and a half hours? All those things. But, you know, we were really excited by that because it, it felt like, you know, we were really, really creating an yeah. event. Yeah. You were, so speaking of uh, audiences paying for tickets, you you did an incredible initiative in London to bring in a wider range of audiences at, at some at prices they could afford. And you're doing that here. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I mean, we, we were very, very aware, weren't we, from the start that this was an audience who were used to paying $20 for a book or a, or a cinema ticket. And, you know, so paying $100 was, was going to be a shock to them. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that those people, you know, that, 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 that they had access to the show. Um, and something like between 65 and 70 percent of our audiences so far in London, and I think it's the same here, have been mm. first time theatre goers. So uh, we and, and I think, you know, that that is in part due to the fact that the, you know, you can see both parts for $40. Here. 300 tickets, 300, 300 tickets, tickets of performance. Three, yes. and, and also then there are 40 seats per show that go in a lottery every Friday, uh -huh. the Friday 40, also for $20 per part. So you can see, you can see five and a half hours of theatre for $40. Um, that's 340 seats for every single show. Ah, we like that. We yeah. like that. We like that too. Don't yeah, we? a lot. Was there ever any talk of making it a musical? Ever? Do you know, some people still think that we've made one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. it's so it's strange. We, it's nev we've never, ever, ever declared it as anything other than a play. Um, I would say that the, we, we, do, we do know it, it operates a bit like a musical in the way that Jack uh, and Joe and John have come to it as a, as a script. And then just because of the way that John and I do work, that it, it, it kind of just rolls forward. And there's certain rhythms in it that are very much like you'd look at a musical. Um, but the, the only thing I've, I've ever heard, one person said, oh, there's, a, there's a moment where Harry walks to the top of a staircase with Hermione, and she said, I thought for a horrible moment he was going to break into song. And I was like, I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I'll take it anyway. But uh, uh, yes, I think it's, it just, because it's on Broadway, I guess, and it's a big two-part thing that, you know, does, it f does, it, does it herald itself as a musical? So we're having to slightly defy people that. So there are no songs yeah. and there's, there's lots of music. So we've scored it like like a musical as well. Yeah. So I think Imogen Heap has created hours of, of, of this beautiful um, score, um, which has been amazing to work with that as well as, as another palette for us to draw from. But um, sadly, no songs. Well, not even sadly, there are no songs. It's a play. But it was never even a topic of discussion. It, w it would never have happened. Jo, jo yeah. uh, was very, very, very clear that she'd turned down every single offer about turning it into a musical. I think she just doesn't like them. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Which is all right, which is fair enough, isn't it? But so. also, don't, we wouldn't do it if it was a musical, I don't think. I, she hasn't it's... seen the right ones, but then there's plenty of wrong right. ones. Right, so. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> but, now, I, I read that you uh, cast a, a fair amount of Shakespearean actors in, the, in this company. Yeah. Going back to the use of the language, why was that important? Um, because it's actually incredibly complex and uh, the, the language is complex. The what, you know what the characters are, uh, are kind of dealing with is very very complex, and I wanted it to have gravitas. Uh, you know, that people people do look at fantasy as a genre which is dismissed easily. You know, when actually, you know, when you look at Grimm's Tales, Aesop, you know, uh, Philip Pullman, uh, C.S. Lewis, actually, when fantasy works, it can get to the heart of human experience much, much. Uh, deeper than e realism and naturalism can, um, and J.K. Rowling certainly kind of knows that. And um, and so um, so, but I wanted I wanted actors that could actually you know take us into that reality. And even though sometimes they're talking about pumpkin pasties and chocolate frogs and you know spells and things, actually what they what, what what they're talking about is the uh, you know the, the the hell of living. Yeah. Um, and so Noma, Jamie, and Paul who play uh, Harry. Sorry, Hermione, uh, Harry, and Ron, they're all very, very kind of uh, renowned classical actors. Um, I wanted to look back at the earlier days when you worked together. Um, I first became aware of you with Blackwatch, which just. That old thing. That old thing. <laughs> which, speaking of the Traverse Theatre, right? Isn't that where that. Uh... Uh, it, it was in conjunction with the Traverse, yeah. it was in a, a drill hall in Edinburgh, but yeah, it was. It was the first and then it came travel. here to St. Anne's Warehouse, yeah, and just blew us all away seeing this. Was that the first time you two had worked together? No. No, no it was only the second. We'd, we'd, we'd worked. Well, Mercury we'd, we'd, Fair? We'd done Mercury Fair. Third Fur. time. The third, yes. Straight to Mercury. Yeah, yeah, third time. But the first time we'd been in a room for the whole rehearsal yeah. process together. Because Stephen was always so busy, I could only get him for the odd day. Um, <laughs> you were quite busy. You were, you were quite busy. You, you, were, you, were, you weren't short on hours. <laughs> no, but it was the first time we'd sat down and gone, okay, let, let, let's create something that we've got no idea what it's going to right, be. Right, right. As opposed to the written script where you can kind of guess what it's going to be. You know, you yeah. get a good sense of what it's going to be. Blackwatch was the first time. It was terrifying, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. About three weeks in, we were like, what on earth are we doing? Yeah. 
we've got no idea what this is. And then at what point did you realize you were going to New York? Well, it wasn't in Edinburgh, so we were told it was never going to tour. Right. Yeah. That was very explicit to really? us as a creative team. It was like, go for your lives. It's, ne it's, it's unfathomably expensive. This will never tour. It's going to play three weeks in a drill hall. Go for it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So when it got the New York date, it was probably about, it was well after it had closed in Edinburgh. Yeah. Yes. Although, although that first preview, do you remember? Yeah. It, we we kind of went, oh, because the audience, because it, we, we did it in Traverse, so, which is like the Edinburgh Tattoo, which I'd been to at Edinburgh Castle every year during the Edinburgh Festival, where the audience sit in two seating banks and down the middle parade, uh, you know, mili military uh, companies, bands, armies, etc. Um, and uh, so I'd seen that, so that's what I wanted to create, so, so that we told our story in the middle of, of two seating banks, which is why it was so unwieldy, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but I remember sitting there with Stephen and just watching the people and just stand up and feeling like, oh, wow, this, this isn't ours anymore. Yeah. Uh, that's just a, which is a lovely feeling. Yeah. Now, you're Broadway regulars. So at, w at what point then, uh, was it with that or with Once that you, st that, that you started to feel that Broadway was going to bring you into their fold? I mean, that you'd kind of made it as Broadway artists. I don't think anybody ever feels like they're a Broadway artist full out. I mean, I always think, like most people, you, get a, you might get a tap on the shoulder and told your time's up and you've done very well. <laughs> I, I genuinely, I, I think... Or not I, very well. Or not, or, yeah, <laughs> something says not very well. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's very odd for us. I mean, I, I was, in lots of ways, there's, that I've, there, there, there's a career here and there's a, a career in the UK, which is, you know, at my point in life is an absolute, you know, what a charmed life. It really is incredible. Um, but I, I don't ever feel like we've, I don't ever feel like you can play to Broadway mm -hmm. um, in some respects. And I, I think you, you can see certain shows try to arrive here as a Broadway show and, and you know, hell mend them really. But I think, I don't know if we put our head above the parapet for long enough. I don't think we spend right. en enough time outside of a rehearsal room because we're very lucky to work regularly and often. I'm, I'm one of the worst people to talk about the ecology of, of theatre and Broadway because I, I just don't really have a, for the most part, I don't have a sense of Well, that's it. probably a better thing. I think it does help to a degree. I think it does help yeah. us, certainly in rehearsal rooms, we're responsible to, to a certain kind of vision of a piece of art. Um, and if, you know, we've, we have amazing producers on Harry Potter and they've looked beyond our rehearsal room. But we had, we had enough of a problem just getting that thing on its feet. So um, the fact that it's here on Broadway is spectacular and genuinely hand on heart the pair of us would still say it was it was a surprise that this something this big uh, landed here so there's nothing inevitable in our minds so i don't really think we have a, a very accurate or very good sense of what it is but do, do you think there was something inevitable in your producer's minds about it coming to broadway yes and, and but about, I think that was the hope and i mean yeah. the, and and also that they're taking on they're taking on a, a brand excuse that word you well, know, you, excuse you, that vulgar word, but that they're yeah. taking a, a brand which is already a theme park, yeah. uh, that, you know, that, and, and making it a legitimate theater, but yeah. still that you would think there would be high hopes yeah, but there. You, but you have to remember that it's an, inc it's an incredibly precious uh, I event, Harry Potter. And if we've got it wrong, there's, you, can't, you, can't, you can't, you know, put lights around it and then hopefully push it up. It w mm -hmm. would have been mm -hmm. in real, I mean, it would have just died you could it spoil been, it easy yeah. it would be forgotten rinsed. about yeah yeah, yeah. we'd have yeah. been rinsed it would be put yeah. quietly to where nobody remembered it well it would be the harry potter went too far well it'd be the thing you don't put on your cv yeah <laughs> <laughs> it would have, you know it, so i think i think the yeah. producers had until the show opened they did they did all they could to make us as a creative team make the best version possible for the sake of the of the, yeah. of, the of the piece i think for the sake I mean, of the work i had three very kind of uh distinct kind of groups that I really, really was determined not to let down okay. when I agreed to do this. The, the first one was Jo herself because she trusted us with, you know, and she had, you know, with the next, the next story in the most successful and popular lit literary franchise of all time and the next chapter she allows to be a stage play for the first time. It's kind of incredible. So that's, that, that's a real honor and privilege mm. that we had. The second um, group was the, was the fans because I became, you know, very, as Stephen said, you know, that you meet them very quickly and, and it's very clear that, that this means everything to them. And, and in some ways, if, if you've cleaved to Harry Potter when you're 11 and all through your teenage years, then, then it's part of your makeup, it's part of your soul in some ways. So, you know, you can't let them down. And the third group was theater. As a, you know, we, uh, that, that we were taking Harry Potter, we've read the books, we've seen the films, and we were putting it into our beloved art form and telling the story there. And, you know, 
you know, my, as Stephen said, we wanted it to be magical, but also I just didn't want to make Harry Potter boring or make, see, allow theatre to make Harry Potter boring by not having the ambition, by not having the scope of the story, by not having the epic kind of sweep, because I believe theatre can do anything as long as the audience are connected in the right way. Um, and, so, and so I was very, very aware all through that there were those three groups that I really, really, that were very precious to me. Can I ask for the, for the say, habitual theatre goers who maybe are not as familiar with Harry Potter, what is your advice to people coming to see the show? How much of the Harry Potter story do they need to know going in? I can say this, I've sent, I've sent people to the show before and I've told them to read the synopsis of the fourth film or the fourth book. And that tended to be enough for, uh, for that to get quite useful. But if they haven't, are they going to be okay? Yeah. What yeah. about the origin story? Don't you feel like they need to know the origin story of that? That too. Although, although the boy we, who lived, we explore I guess is what that I mean. exactly. Yeah. We explore that quite, quite, quite kind of um, uh, you know deeply through 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 Harry's scenes. That's because true. Because that's what he's kind of dealing with. But just to, I mean, you, you, I'm told by people that have never ever read a word of Harry Potter. Uh, that actually we tell you enough that you can you, you can dive into it, okay? But yeah. So you can do your Harry Potter homework, or you can just go in cold. But totally. audiences have embraced this yeah. show. I mean, as I said, nine Olivier's in London, and and now it's such a, a, a wonderful hit here in New York. It's such a pleasure to have you here, yeah. John Tiffany, Stephen Hoggett, and thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank thank you. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you, guys. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bow Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.